let's jump in. Someone on the internet is yapping. Simo is yapping and saying things, and that's not okay with me. Uh, I have to give my judgment first on the yappage. So uh, let's take a look and see what kind of yappage he's got for us today. All right, Mr. Chimo. I don't think Simo's done, like, discussion videos in a while, right? Like, he's kind of like a TV channel with, like, all of these TV shows going on. This article History, popped prog, up in my et cetera, et cetera. Titled, As Yu-Gi-Oh! prepares I have that same 25, hoodie. the card game has never felt more welcoming for newcomers. We Does sure about disagree? that? I only skimmed Whoa, the article, disagrees. but I thought this... Is Yu-Gi-Oh! welcoming for new players? Gosh. I want to say, like, 2019 was the best possible time to jump into the game. Uh, you had uh, accessible cheap decks like um, Salmon Great, three structure decks. Uh, you had, even if you wanted to play the best deck, Orcust, I don't think was that bad, other than like a couple of staple cards, maybe. Although, you know, it's historically, you know, five years ago, almost at this point. Toss format was almost five, half a decade ago, by the way. Doesn't that make you, uh, doesn't that make you think? Uh, but yeah, that was probably one of the best times to jump into the game, was just after that horrible onslaught that was 2018, which was weird, by the way, because that was record-breaking tournament events. So 2018 was the worst year for Yu-Gi-Oh, in my opinion, but yet it was breaking YCS records. Make it make sense? I don't know. Anyway. This would actually be some good content to react to and just give my two cents because oh, it's the an way article. that okay. this seems to be going, especially given the current discourse surrounding card prices, I'm not sure if this article was written like a couple months back and is now being published, but I think this will be Articles a good Articles have read. dates, you know, Simo, you can read it. offerings, wide card availability, and a healthy competitive scene have helped the TCG put its best foot forward a quarter century in. All right. When exactly was this? Three weeks ago. So what are we talking about? Is this just before Phantom Nightmare? I think 6th of February, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, but this was just before the release of Phantom Nightmare, which you could argue this would be true, right? If you if you specifically are jumping in now to uh, Snake Eye format, this is probably very wrong. Um, so I think like it's unfortunate that literally a couple days later, this article aged like milk. I want to say is like a defining factor here. Oh, this is going to be good. Can I just start <laughs> off by saying I love that they chose this picture of Japanese Yu-Gi-Oh cards that are like some of the newer ones because to most people, this and is so what Yu-Gi-Oh like, looks like. To people well. like us who actually play Yu-Gi-Oh, like this is fine. But to anyone else outside of the Yu-Gi-Oh space, it just looks like complete gibberish. So I think this picture is already setting Racist? the tone for I'm what's joking. to come. Having recently picked up an analog pocket, stumbling upon a copy of one of the old Yu-Gi-Oh World Championship video games in the process, the 2006 edition specifically, I felt a way... Okay, I can't wait till that shit comes to the Steam store when we get the old Yu-Gi-Oh games, like, modernized. ...wave of nostalgia rush over me. The game was released during the peak of my childhood obsession with the card game, long before the responsibilities of age made it difficult to reconnect with this love until many years later. Booting the game felt like a time capsule as I glanced at the decks my childhood self had built on that cartridge. The game represented the days where Yu-Gi-Oh felt not just exciting but accessible for everyone, a relic from the final moments of the pre-archetype era that made it simple for anyone to pool their cards together for a competitive or casual duel with friends or strangers alike. So like, this is always, like, untrue, right? It's one of, like, the biggest things that people bring up when it comes to, like, old Yu-Gi-Oh, quote-unquote, is they say, like, oh, yeah, um, you can, uh, you can just play whatever you want, it was fun, and stuff like that. And it was, like, no, not really, like, the optimized versions of those decks you would never beat, right? If you were playing as, like, an actual optimized, fully built, properly, you know, corrected deck, like, you would lose. The problem and the difference is that it's not like today, where everything is optimized, all of the information is accessible any one time on the internet, you can literally just type in best deck, Unironically, and you will get probably a very good deck list, um, which just you could not do in 2003 or 2002, I think was the starter decks, right? So we can already see where the author's coming from, right? You know, like me, they're probably just a boomer when it comes to Yu-Gi-Oh! And they appreciate the golden age of, you know, before archetypes really existed. And you could just pick up whatever playground staples you had and just play a game with friends. I think that's the Yu-Gi-Oh! that a lot of people remember from their childhood. And so it makes sense, especially given that this is, what, 2006? So we're talking about a post-GOAT format, like post-Reaper format time, which was actually a lot of fun for a lot of people. Because this is right before, like, Teledad and all that nonsense as well. So that was... Plus, like, a lot of those, like, staple expensive cards weren't as impactful, right? Uh, like, Jinzo, Jinzo, I think, was maybe, like, an expensive card. And, like, you know, you'd have to draw it, first of all, right? So even if your friend had a Jinzo, like, it wasn't guaranteed they would even see it during the match. Um, which is very different to, to today, right? Because if your opponent has a win condition in their deck, the deck is designed to get to that win condition turn one with the speed of the game, right? Compared to back then, where win conditions were, like, things you had to, like, draw on, like, turn 8, for example. 
Yu-Gi-Oh! is a pretty good time to be playing Yu-Gi-Oh! So even if As you're playing -Oh like a more pile of garbage deck, you can still maybe like... complexity was one of the reasons my style itself lost interest in the game. Beyond a spell of play during the early 2010s, it took almost a decade to find the time to dedicate to the TCG once again. Even by the time nostalgia fueled this return, those same concerns over complexity and accessibility remained. The introduction of Pendulums and the beginning of Link Monster era once again appending the conventions of the game. I like the subtle nod to Edison format, really saying they, beyond like, the spell of play during Pendulum the early then. 2010s, because obviously with Edison being the most popular retro format now, that's just hilarious. But I also feel that Pendulums and Link Monster specifically were just kind of the final straw for a lot of people when it comes to Yu-Gi-Oh. Honestly, Synchros and Xyz were the final straw for a lot of people too, because that represents <laughs> You know, it's funny, we think about, like, uh, Synchros and Xyz being, like, some of the uh, most fun mechanics and stuff like that, right? Like, a lot of uh, people love, like, Sword Soul, for example. No bias intended there. Um, with, like, the Synchro mechanic. But when Synchros were first being, like, shown, when Xe monsters were first being, like, developed, like, people people lost their shit over that, right? Because obviously, like, Yu-Gi-Oh! community is always going to complain because that's just human nature and psychology of our behavior. Uh, but people just cry about everything, obviously. Uh, but don't think that those didn't have backlash and pushback either, you know? Now, it's interesting that he did mention uh, Link Monsters, he did mention Pendulum Monsters. Pendulum Monsters, I personally don't know anyone who quit the game because Pendulum existed. I don't, I don't remember that. I, in my local scene and the people that I was around and surrounded by, I don't recall people quitting the game because of Pendulum. Uh, similarly, what I will say is... The biggest mass inf, inf what's the opposite of uh, influx expulsion explode <laughs> exodus that's the word I'm looking at the ma the big the mass exodus of the player base that I saw in my local area came from Link era Master of Four Link monsters deleted my friend group by fifty percent. That's what Link Monsters did to my 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 Yu-Gi-Oh. Like, and that's why one of the biggest reasons why I hated 2018 wasn't even so much that the format was bad or anything. Maybe I could have enjoyed some of those decks. I probably would have enjoyed Danger FTK in hindsight. But it was a really bad time, like socially and emotionally and psychologically, because half of my friends quit the game in Link Era. You know what I mean? And that was hard. Like that was a really hard time to like deal with presented just a fundamental change of Yu-Gi-Oh as a whole but but again like I said earlier it's weird because numbers wise the game was at its most successful at least in terms of event attendance we don't know what the uh product uh sales were like for Konami we don't know what if they were making record breaking sales and products um I don't know but if we just look at the pure raw numbers of attendance that's when Yu-Gi-Oh sort of like boomed a lot right there was a lot of people there but on a personal level a lot of my friends quit the game in 2018 because of Link Monsters, and that was kind of heartbreaking. Pendulum summoning specifically really rubbed people the wrong way just because it was a drastic but I did experience this with Pendulum, but every locals is different. Cards themselves just took a major departure from what Yu-Gi-Oh cards are, but at the end of the day, Yu-Gi-Oh is one of the most ridiculous card games there is, and that's part of like the appeal. But I can also understand that from a complexity perspective, there is a point where I think Yu-Gi-Oh just becomes the most complex card game just solely based on the fact that there's so many different summoning mechanics and there's just so much going on that's also not even just printed on the cards themselves that it is a turnoff for a lot of people. For all the complexities we to and entry Yu-Gi-Oh is like the learning curve. And the joy of playing Yu-Gi-Oh has shrunk considerably. In fact, looking back on many of the releases from 2023 as we look ahead to a tentpole anniversary year for the game, Yu-Gi-Oh has never been more welcoming and accessible to newcomers as it feels today. I want to reserve my judgment here, but I've agreed with just about everything the author has said up until this point, but in terms of Yu-Gi-Oh has never been more welcoming and accessible to newcomers as it feels today, I think that is a highly subjective framework to be basing this article on, but I want to reserve judgment until we see what arguments they present. This is the result. I think one of the most welcoming things you can have in a game is affordability, right? And I don't think that's been true for a while, unfortunately. Like, even before, like, Phantom Nightmare, if you were playing any deck, you probably wanted a copy of SP, which is just, like, a $100, like, game piece that is kind of really important, fundamental to your deck. Like, I guess you can get away with playing Nightmare Unicorn that sort of does the same thing, but even going second like that card is, like, super important, and one less material is, you know, one less material. Um... So in terms of affordability, I, I, I don't know. Um, that is like it's never gonna be as affordable as something like Pokemon, right? That that just it is what it is. Like that's just a fact. Um, so let's, of a let's see what arguments we present here. An approach that we covered throughout last year and comes from a dedicated attempt to revitalize the game and encourage new audiences, both old and young, to not just try Yu-Gi-Oh, but enjoy their experience enough to stick around afterwards. It's a process that first began during the 2010s with the release of various companion games for mobile and other devices, starting with the release of Duel Links and the speedier, simplified physical format of Speed Duel. I want to take a brief... By the way, just like it's 
sometimes mind-boggling to realize how successful Duel Links is. Um, a lot of people don't really think about that, and I don't really know the extent to the success of it over in the TCG, but there's been plenty of revenue reports and all of those kind of like, you know, quarter quarterly earning calls and stuff that we've seen from the various shareholder companies and stuff like that. Before Master Duel, Duel Links was massive like the biggest card game than every other card game in the world like combined like it was beating like the combination of hearthstone um magic arena plus every other like what's it called um digital card game like combined like duel links was demol like by double it was mind-blowing um so yeah I, I it's crazy to think but i i never really knew that because i didn't really know anyone who played duel links which is weird but i guess a lot of that is a driving force from japan probably but duel links was a huge success for the game um and i'm wondering how much that actually influenced people's decision to venture into, into tcg potentially Leave aside right here and share a personal philosophy i have with Yu-Gi-Oh, where Yu-Gi-Oh has this identity crisis issue where konami for some reason feels the need to trick people into playing Yu-Gi-Oh by not actually playing Yu-Gi-Oh. they almost just use <laughs> Yu-Gi-Oh as the skin for whatever game they're trying to produce to basically sell people on the game you can take this concept all the way back to some of the very first Yu-Gi-Oh games that ever existed right i mean look at I think what he's, like, trying to get at here is, like, uh, we are presented Yu-Gi-Oh! as, like, this um, game that you can play uh, as its modern shell that it is today, you know, competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! But, like, they have to, like, sort of cover it up with, like, things like Duel Links and Speed Duels. And, you know, that's your sort of introductory way to play the game, uh, which is, for better or for worse, I think um, definitely a way to ease people in. But it's never going to be representative and indicative of, like, what, how the actual real game plays. Games like Forbidden Memories or Dungeon Dice Monsters or just all these bizarre games, Capsule Monster Coliseum and like Duelist of the Roses, False Bound Kingdom, like all of these old games that are Yu-Gi-Oh, but it's not actually playing the Yu-Gi-Oh trading card. That was like the biggest turnoff for me when I was like a kid was like Forbidden Memories. Like that wasn't a Yu-Gi-Oh game. <laughs> like it was a it was a game that had a Yu-Gi-Oh theme, but it wasn't Yu-Gi-Oh. Like that game does not play like Yu-Gi-Oh. Probably because it was 1999. Uh, and the game didn't have formalized rules by then or something. I might be messing up the timeline in my mind, but, you know, like, I guess that makes sense. But that was, like, kind of a big turnoff for me. Like, Duels of the Rose as well. Like, what the hell is that game? Like, that is not a Yu-Gi-Oh game. Game. It's like chess, but Yu-Gi-Oh. Or it's like some other weird game, but it's Yu-Gi-Oh themed. And that issue still exists even in modern times. But like even as you go I through think that's why all the different, so the different Yu-Gi-Oh games oh that existed, like the Sacred Cards or all of these other older Game Boy games and such, I don't know why it's so difficult for a Yu-Gi-Oh game to just be Yu-Gi-Oh. And the author alluded to the World Championship games, which were what they were. They, it was Yu-Gi-Oh. It was clean cut, just one on one Yu-Gi-Oh, which is what a lot of. Which, by the way, um. Don't forget that those games were some of the most successful. Weird, isn't it? The games that were closely um, most related to actual competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! for their time were the ones that did uh, did the best. Crazy, I know. But, like, you could build, like, meta decks in those uh, WCS games contextual to their time. And they're, like, the best ones. Of people wanted. And so when it comes to Speed Duel and Duel Links specifically, yes, they're still Yu-Gi-Oh, but there's still gimmicks to them that don't make them like the actual card game. And that's not to say that people still can't enjoy fair, those is probably at the level formats, of modern but it's just bizarre point. to me that a card game as popular as Yu-Gi-Oh doesn't lean into the fact that people want to play the actual card game, and instead we have to release all of these other, like, peripheral games just to keep people in the ecosystem of Yu-Gi-Oh. It's just bizarre. We've talked about the uncertain existence of the physical incarnation of the format during COVID in the past, but the success of Duel Link's mobile game is undeniable. Far from being nothing more than a healthy revenue stream for Konami as a company, the game brought yeah, with a very healthy of revenue stream. players enthused by the bite-sized experience the game offered. Many even made the jump to the physical edition of Speed Duel, a mode that has felt at least partially bolstered by the return of in-person competition. While far door so this video, I think, was uh, 6th of February. This <laughs> this video was posted before Speed Duel has been announced dead. I, I haven't really kept up too much with the news, but I think Speed Duel's dead. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think they literally just shut that down. Only in Europe? Okay, cool. Not announced. So there's like a leaked, not leaked, but like someone sent an email asking about Speed Duel release dates in Europe. And the email came back from Konami. If anyone has a link to it, then feel free to show it in the chat. But like, there was like an email coming back from like customer service saying that there will not be like future product or something in this region or something like that. I don't remember the exact wording. I don't want to like paraphrase. Oh, okay, here we go. We've got it here. But I, I think that that game is already like gone now, <laughs> which is funny because this was like a couple weeks ago.
uh, that this video was uh, was made here. God, I'm trying to get used to using a new browser right now. Yeah, shout outs to Opera. Thank you for reaching out to us with your interest in Yu-Gi-Oh. Uh, we have no plans to re release Speedo GX midterm destruction in the EU territories. For all new information, etc., blah, 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 follow here. So yeah, TL, we have no plans to release Speedo GX midterm destruction in EU territories. That's an entire, like, core set or whatever you want to call it. That just, just isn't going to be released in EU. Why? Are they shutting it down? You know what I mean? Worked by tournaments for the main game, the existence of Speed Duel as a side event at YCS tournaments and remote duel events alongside the consistent launch of new reasonably priced products has cultivated a dedicated community of players supportive of this new alternative way of play. So there's no denying that Duel Links is incredibly profitable for Konami because if you think about it, they're already taking assets that they've already created, digitizing them, releasing them, and cherry picking them in a way that they see fit, and then also making it that with all the gotcha mechanics that you're going to have to spend hundreds if not thousands of dollars to acquire the new cards, especially the way that they come out that you actually need them that way, that they're going to make an absolute shit ton of money off of that. And so Speed Duel, I think, is a little bit more generous in this regard just because with Speed Duel, a lot of the product is pretty self-contained. And when it comes to Speed Duel and Duel Links, though, the issue is sort of what I was alluding to before, right? It's Yu-Gi-Oh, but Yu-Gi-Oh Light, if you want to look at it that way. I mean, you only have the three zones for everything. There's the skill cards, which the skill cards are a Good whole other discussion because they completely just bypass like complete entire mechanics of certain decks. They just or errata the game, man. I hate skill cards. In modern Yu-Gi-Oh would make those strategies unplayable. And so for Duel Links or Speed Duel specifically, actually allow these types of strategies to be played but it's sort of like some weird cheeky cop out as a result but then you also have the fact that you're pl so i kind of disagree with this i think like early on this was true like maybe 2016 2017 um which i think roughly was around like the first years of duel links's lifespan where you we, we would be playing like you know metal Falls, pendulum summon toad uh summon multiple like frogs and paleos and then we had like you know goki ftk and stuff like that and i think like the power level of duel links was like summon cabazoles into like you know a little bit later we had like vampires um and then uh you know there was also like god what were some of the like cyber angel you know red eyes right like like really low power simple decks right so you could argue back then it was like a mirage of like real modern Yu Gi Oh, um but Definitely in recent years and stuff, like, um, Duel Links is basically modern Yu-Gi-Oh. Like, if you can play Duel Links well, like, you will probably be able to easily jump into competitive Yu-Gi-Oh in the TCG. It's a, it's, it's a, de a delayed format, of course, um, but it's far enough into the game's lifespan where it has the speed, power creep, and level of complexity that modern Yu-Gi-Oh has. Uh, so I think Duel Links is there in terms of that regard, but that's not, that doesn't make Duel Links a good game automatically. Um, it's, Duel Links is... A good game, uh, gameplay wise. <laughs> that's not the issue I have with Duel Links, isn't it? Gameplay. Although you know, so the skill cards are a little bit ridiculous. <laughs> the issue with Duel Links is the obtaining of those cards. Playing uh, Yu-Gi-Oh, you know. at least in the instance of like Speed Duel, right? You're playing Yu-Gi-Oh. That is like how Bank people played the game back in like the early or rather late 2000s or maybe early 2010s. I know Duel Links obviously has more of the summoning mechanics because Duel well, Links I is a lot play older. Compared I don't know. Boy, has been playable but for years. At the end Duel of the day, Link. this is sort of just channeling what people really liked about old Yu-Gi-Oh and just repackaging it, rebranding it, and trying to appeal to that audience. But again, I don't understand why we have to have this separation between the two. I guess you could argue that from an accessibility standpoint. Yes, it allows people to play Yu-Gi-Oh!, but if you're looking at Yu-Gi-Oh! top-down, the main game of Yu-Gi-Oh!, this is not people playing the main game. This is people playing, like, a side product, which I guess is still inclusive of the overall Yu-Gi-Oh! community, but I think it's a bit unfair to say that you're trying to use this as a segue to say that Yu-Gi-Oh! is very inclusive as a whole, because I just don't think that... So, Simo's criticism here of this article seems to stem from the fact that, well, if you aren't playing Yu-Gi-Oh! the correct way, which is modern advanced competitive Yu-Gi-Oh!, then it's like, um, then it isn't real Yu-Gi-Oh!. I would disagree with that because I think, like, there's different multiple ways to approach the game, um, and it's really just contextual to the person themselves. The problem is that none of it is, like, officially supported, uh... And I think, like, any of it that is officially supported, I don't think there should be this stigma that it's like, oh, well, Duel Links, yeah, but that's not real Yu-Gi-Oh, right? Um, and one of the most, pers uh, one of the most like, important terms that I've ever learned in my life, uh, shout-outs to peeps, is your perception is your reality, right? Um, if you perceive Duel Links to be, like, the best form of content that is your fun way of engaging with Yu-Gi-Oh! and the Yu-Gi-Oh! universe, and that's good enough for you, then good for you, right? And th that's what makes you happy, that's how you perceive... Uh, Yu-Gi-Oh to be real Yu-Gi-Oh, then that's that's fine, right? Like that's totally cool. Um, 
So I don't think like there should be this sort of angle where it's like, well, it's not real Yu-Gi-Oh. You know, it's not actually how you play Yu-Gi-Oh. It's like, well, to that person, it is how you play Yu-Gi-Oh, and that's what matters to them, and that's the most important thing. Uh, so I, I I think that's probably how I would describe it with regards to like all of these peripheral things in the Yu-Gi-Oh universe, and I think that's probably what Yu-Gi-Oh actually needs. I would go so far as to go in the other direction and say. There doesn't need to be a segue into, oh, okay, well, how do we make them spend money in the TCG? How do we make them into, uh, you know, full-time Yu-Gi-Oh players, right? I think um, I think having, like, these random peripheral games that are not actually Yu-Gi-Oh is, like, good, right? Like, I think, like, Duel Links is, like, a good, you know, form of way engaging with Yu-Gi-Oh. Heck, even Cross Duel potentially could have been a good idea. The only reason I didn't engage with uh, Cross Duel is because it was too expensive. It's just, again, it's one of those, you know... I don't know if it was a good game or not. I generally couldn't tell you if Cross Duel was a good game or not. But I didn't engage with it because it was way too expensive and I'm not spending money like that. Do you know what I'm saying? Clearly, it wasn't a good way because the game shut down. So, you know, unfortunate. Um, but yeah, this is why I think like the game needs more officially recognized uh, standard formats that aren't just advanced constructed. Uh, so plenty of more Time Wizard formats. This is why Magic does so successfully, I feel like, at the casual level. People love Commander, which is like not a competitive format. I think, right? That's I mean, my, my, my magic knowledge isn't perfect. Um, but, you know, like, is, 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 would anyone turn around to a magic player and be like, oh, Commander isn't real uh, magic? I don't think so, right? Because that's, to those people, that is how they engage with the game. And that's okay, because that's all they care about, right? So, um, it, it's fine, right? Anyway, yeah, that's uh, just a little side point there. And that's not to say that, like, Simo's, like, gatekeeping or anything. I don't think that's his intention. I think he is just specifically referring specifically to competitive Yu-Gi-Oh!, which is fine. I just think, like, I don't think you need to be engaged in competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! in order for it to be real Yu-Gi-Oh!, do you know what I'm saying? That's true. Also, when it comes to Duel Links specifically, I mean, when it comes to like this product here, the Speed Duel GX box, this is fantastic because you can just buy one of these, get some friends, and you have like a whole draft experience. This is arguably like one of the best products ever made for pick up and play Yu-Gi-Oh, which is something that arguably this game has had an issue with. And I think a lot of card games struggle with to a degree. Yu-Gi-Oh specifically, like a lot of people want to say, yes, you can just buy some structure decks and then you have a deck that you can play. Sure, but in the context of a modern competitive format, that deck is not nearly going to be enough in very rare instances, maybe. But for the most part, it's not going to be enough to compete with the other strategies at play with the gx box specifically or any of this so talking about like the structure decks and the pre-design things konami have gotten pretty decent at making those things fairly competitive um and again it really is just i think the most important thing is that it comes down to what you interpret as competitive i would argue that three trap trick structure decks or three shadal showdown structure decks or uh three albaz structure decks um we've had a, a lot of different examples i would argue those are actually pretty competitive but it in regards to what context are you going to top a ycs with those no absolutely Jesus not so not without gross. like including other very important staples is it enough to sit down and have a great fun time with some friends absolutely right so again it's about like what is the context of competitive that you're talking about what is the context of viable that we're referring to here um i think is is key and important and the problem with Yu-Gi-Oh! is that there is not, there is no way to differen differentiate that. There isn't a way to categorize people between, like, you know, fully optimized competitive players and casual players. There isn't a way to properly label people um, in these ways. There isn't a format for these people, right? Um, because in the end, like, if you if we were to... Like, look, my biggest example is, is look at, like, Master Duel's casual mode, right? What is that? What is the casual mode? It's ranked without a score but that doesn't affect the card pool that doesn't change anything like you're still playing against like the same like decks and stuff like that it's just people playing the meta decks but like practicing them pretty much right so it's like you t but that but the person who just wants to play with like a bunch of random stuff they've pulled from a draft like they're not going to compete with that so it's like the, the problem is like the game doesn't have ways and doesn't have environments for people to enjoy the game that they want to is the issue QBs, the box products. I think they've had the GX box and the Battle City box at this point. These products are meant to be played almost sort of like a board game where there's eight different decks that you can sort of mix and match things if you wish. And you get a couple friends, you have the box, you share it, and you just play it as a self-contained product. So it's almost like a board game in that regard. That's good, And I right? think that's fine at the end of the day for getting people to play Yu-Gi-Oh! But I still think it's a separation between that and modern Yu-Gi-Oh! Which is what Yu-Gi-Oh! is today. Duel Links, on the other hand, and I'm not sure if the article will get more into detail about Duel Links, but Duel Links, alternatively, you have to spend... There's a 
a free-to-play element, of course, like all games have nowadays, but when it comes to Duel Links specifically, you're having to spend maybe as much as if you'd be playing the modern TCG More than that. for an entire digital More collection that. that you can't even resell on the secondary market to get out of the game itself. So in that sense, it's not nearly as accessible because you're sort of locked in with what you get. For those looking to get into the game, it, which I assume they're talking about the GX box, remains the cheapest way to get into the game. Two sets containing four decks, each and everything you need to play, were launched in 2023 at under 25 pounds per box. And Konami has already committed to at least one the more set he said in 2024. Pounds there. Ugh, the reliance on nostalgia with beloved characters as skills and a generally older card pool is no coincidence either, encouraging lapsed players back into the game for a cheap transitional path back to the main game or a casual way to play the game without being put off by the commitment necessary for main events. What I find interesting about this paragraph, Jesus and I understand that the speed duel boxes came prior to what I'm about to say, so maybe that could partially be responsible for what's at play here. Thank but you, with I'll the release of after. the Time Wizard events and the Ultimate Time Wizard events that take place at YCS's, where retro formats are actually being encouraged and embraced at the moment so that if you want to play an alternative way of Yu-Gi-Oh, it's still at its core Yu-Gi-Oh in a snapshot of time that isn't diverging from what Yu-Gi-Oh is at its essence. Again, Speed Duels is still Yu-Gi-Oh, but it's a variation and a different way to play Yu-Gi-Oh, where hypothetically, GOAT format and Edison format, which are the two most popular retro formats, are actual snapshots of Yu-Gi-Oh in their respective timelines, 2005, 2010, and you're still playing Yu-Gi-Oh at its core. You're not adding any other supplement. I disagree. I think Speed Duel is still playing Yu-Gi-Oh at its core. Yeah, there's like a couple of differences, like two less zones um, and like skill cards, but they don't impact the game enough to the point where it's like, is this really that different from uh, Edison and Goat format? They're still, you, you, if you learn to play Speed Duel, you will learn, that will teach you how to play modern competitive Yu-Gi-Oh. Not to the complexity of the archetypes, but mechanically, you'll, you will get a good fundamental understanding of the game. Elementary gimmicks, you're not taking things away, you're not starting at half life points. It's still Yu-Gi-Oh! And so that sort of begs the question from me like is that if really we're easily. at a point now where we're seeing this rise in popularity of these alternative formats, where is like the GOAT format draft box? Where is the Edison format draft box? I think that would be oh, he's an incredibly popular oh, product he's given the rise in popularity of all these alternative formats. And that way you're not having to package it as being a completely separate format. It can still be packaged as Yu-Gi-Oh! Not Yu-Gi-Oh! Speed Duel, not Yu-Gi-Oh! Whatever. It's just Yu-Gi-Oh! And you're giving reprints to players as well for those respective formats because some people are actually priced out because those cards haven't been and I can't wait till like we get like a years. I think there's a lot of legacy potential there. Products, and so man. it's just strange that once again Konami is format, relying on the nostalgia to repackage Yu-Gi-Oh in a different way than just embracing and leaning into the fact that Time Wizard formats are incredibly popular the retro formats that are the self-contained formats that people played before is what people actually want and just send that I can also say from experience I don't know why they don't do that I'm sure there's some logic behind it um I guess it's weird because like um, I think, like, from a financial perspective, my uh, my guess is that if you sell someone a product like the Speed Duel GX box, where it's like, oh, here's like um, here's just like a here's like four Edison decks that you can pick up and play between friends, uh, that's you done, right? Like, you just have a full deck now, and you will never spend another penny because you just have like an Edison deck. So it's not profitable to make those products. I guess is maybe the logic, but even then, it's like, are they really making money? from the secondary market from people selling like 10 year old light sworn cards to build edison decks like i don't think so so it just feels like why don't they make those products and i think it's because they're trying to drip feed it into new products so you saw like the battles of legend set for example we had recently a couple weeks ago you saw like there was a lot of like random like edison cards in there so i think that's what they're trying to do instead of like having an actual cool crazy product like he's describing uh which would be insane for the game i think from attending YCS level events, you do not see the speed duel events firing off nearly as much as you do for something like the Time Wizard Edison pods, for instance. Now, again, I want to be a bit fair here because I'm pretty sure these products came prior to Time Wizard format even existing and being something that Konami wanted to even start launching in the first place. So maybe we are seeing that transition here. But in any case, I still think it's a valid argument that we should be giving people the actual retro Yu-Gi-Oh! And if you're going to lean into nostalgia, go that path instead of this. But that doesn't take away from the fact that the GX box is still an insanely popular product. And I still think it's a solid product altogether. It's a mode that remains under I've question. Not, by the way, I've never seen anyone play those speed duel boxes. Rush duel in Japan, in Might just be my local, I've never seen anyone pick it up and play it. in English for the first time following its introduction to Duel Links as an additional mode. Yet the continued affirmation of this cheaper entry point is worth celebrating, and an uptick in events in 2023 coinciding with the full-scale reintroduction of in-person events is a signal of intent that the company intends to retrain a cheaper entry point going forward, regardless of which format becomes the cheaper entry point is this is that th this is maybe true in japan but like if you want to play rush duel and duel links isn't it just as expensive like 
priority moving forward. I definitely agree that, especially surrounding the recent price discourse when it comes to Yu-Gi-Oh prices in general, that there does need to be cheaper onboarding entry paths for people to play the game, not only just like with their friends, but even like at a higher competitive level. But I also think that the argument could be made that they could be doing it in a much different way that could be more productive overall and also more sustainable at the same time. I'm just saying, if they make the Edison draft box, I'm probably going to buy 10. The announcement of Rush Duel's introduction to the came to last year's Yu-Gi-Oh! World Championships. It was an event that not only signaled the grand return of the centerpiece of the competitive calendar, streamed worldwide for audiences on YouTube and Twitch, but affirmed the company's commitment to reaching players where they are, rather than forcing players to come to them in order to compete. This was the first year a World Championship and the mega-hit free-to-play Master Duel was crowned, joining Duel Links as the second digital crown awarded at the event. Rush Duel is another example yeah, of a Yu-Gi-Oh! skinned Links. game that isn't actual Yu-Gi-Oh! And for those who've never played it, it only recently just came to Duel Links at the time of recording this video, and if you've never seen Rush Duels or played Rush Duels or even seen a Rush Duel card, it's Yu-Gi-Oh! at a fundamental level, but it plays completely differently for so many reasons. You're able to summon multiple times in a turn. Well, I mean, you can do that in regular Yu-Gi-Oh! But you're able to draw five cards every single turn, and it has different types of summoning mechanics. And again, it's Yu-Gi-Oh! But also not. And so, again, we're taking this bizarre detour away from Yu-Gi-Oh! itself. And I know, obviously, it's supposed to follow the Rush Duel anime and things like that. But it it's not really a bizarre detour. It's very specifically made to be simpler Yu-Gi-Oh! To, you know, get more people into the game. Like, there's a reason Rush Duel is, like, the number one format for, like, kids in Japan. Uh, it's massively popular. Um, and it's because it's easy to understand and simple. And then the idea is that it will segue people into modern, I suppose. Which, it's, it's just weird. Like, why do we need to have all of these different types of Yu-Gi-Oh cards that don't even all coincide with the main game itself? Because you have regular Yu-Gi-Oh cards, you have Speed Duel Yu-Gi-Oh cards, which you can use Speed Duel Yu-Gi-Oh cards in regular Yu-Gi-Oh, but you can't use regular Yu-Gi-Oh cards in Speed Duel. And then you have Rush Duels, which technically don't even have cards that are in US printings or any non-Japanese printings, as far as I'm concerned. So the only real way to play with those, but like, why do we have all these different cards? Like, let's just play with our Yu-Gi-Oh cards. <laughs> Well, TL, there they are. The reason is because they're trying to get more people into the game. That's like the fundamental uh, goal behind things like Rush Duel, right? It's, it's because they want more people to play the game. And playing Rush Duel is easier than playing Modern OCG. And, you know, the numbers don't lie. OCG, um, uh, sorry, Rush Duel is massively popular in Japan. Hugely popular. Um, and it's because of its simplicity and because of its aimed towards uh, the younger generations, right? So uh, I don't think he's very correct here. Like, I understand what he's saying, obviously, because it's like... But I think he seems very fixated on this concept of, like, there's a correct Yu-Gi-Oh! Um, and I don't think that necessarily has to be true. Did I miss something? I thought Rush was struggling. Potentially recently, but at least, like, um, but offer a new way for those TCG uh, last year and, like, the early inceptions of Rush 2, it, it was hugely popular. Everyone on Team Snipe Hunters has extensive TCG experience prior to Master Duel Championship glory, while Joshua Schmidt won the most recent YCS Bologna just months after That's the him. championship crowning Master Duel escapades. I will say that there's no denying the power that Duel Links and Master Duel, but I actually want to say more so Duel Links in this regard, just because Duel Links has been around for a lot longer, have contributed to getting people back into playing Yu-Gi-Oh! in some capacity. And sure, I have been arguing this entire time that they are different from the actual competitive, like what Yu-Gi-Oh! is today. But I've talked with so many individuals who said they started by picking up Duel Links because in terms of accessibility, you just download the app, right? I mean, and it is free to play up into an extent, but it sort of gives you your first dose of cardboard crack. And then once you start getting back into it, then they're going to start picking up actual cards and start going to locals and competing. And so it sort of starts the cycle. And so Duel Links is responsible for getting a lot of people playing again. And Master Duel, I feel like, is just a better iteration of Duel Links in that regard because it's the closest digital platform that does resemble actual modern Yu-Gi-Oh! in a lot of ways. Granted, there are still some differences, and I'm sure we'll get into that in a moment. But in terms of accessibility from that perspective, I definitely think we are in a golden age in terms of allowing people to play the game physically or digitally. There are a multitude of ways to access the game. Notably, while both games have extensive microtransactions, these are free-to-play titles that have garnered huge fan bases. Yeah, I mean, Master Duel is like the best, bit, like easiest, simplest entry into Yu-Gi-Oh! Um, it's, it's, it doesn't handhold you enough, I think, to really get you into the modern game. If you play Master Duel blind, it's a kind of a terrible experience, actually. But in terms of like just the simplest, fastest way to play, uh, it is like the best way, probably. But yeah, I think like, you know, that's a whole other topic that we could spend like hours talking about. But Master Duel is definitely like not handholdy enough if you play that game blind. And we saw Raran, for example, right? That's like the best example that we have as an experiment, right? Like it is pretty terrible to play that. Um, but then again, like, you know, remember the rank one, uh, number one duelist in the world, uh, sorry, in Europe, who qualified for the world championship last year, uh, you know, he joined my stream and we had like a, th a talk and stuff and he started playing Yu-Gi-Oh! in Master Duel and then qualified to Worlds. So, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I guess Raran just ain't, ain't that good at the game, baby. <laughs>
This is precisely because they offer a free introduction to the game. It gives players a taste of what Yu-Gi-Oh can be for those who give the game a chance, encouraging many to make the jump to the physical TCG as a result. That's literally what I just said. I guess I should have read ahead before I said anything. <laughs> I suppose that brings up an interesting point with Master Duel specifically, though, because a lot of people argue that because Master Duel is its own self-contained format that differs from both the TCG and the OCG, it begs the question that if both platforms are incredibly successful at onboarding people from digital to physical, why would you not just lean into that as much as possible and full send giving people the TCG, the OCG, and then you can keep the Master Duel format. I think that's perfectly fine, but I don't know why you wouldn't allow people to pick and choose which format they want to play, and that way enhance their experience, because if they want to just practice for TCG, they can play TCG. If they want to experience what the OCG format is like if you're a TCG player you can try out the OCG format and vice versa but if you solely want to focus on the master duel with like the duelist cups and such to be able to try to compete for the world championship then you play in the master duel format it doesn't seem that complicated maybe there's this inherent fear on Konami uh so I like this is a long TLDR um but I think like probably the most logical speculations and stuff that we've like managed to conjure up and discuss is like um they don't want to split the player base between multiple different formats um is like the biggest takeaway uh because it would be a big push to like have like a tcg format in master duel there'd be no reason to play like and engage with the ocg products and cards um and vice versa is probably like i think like maybe the main reason why they don't do it um and i guess maybe potentially taking away from like in real life play because if you can play like if you were playing tcg today and it was also in master duel there's maybe an argument to be had that like well i'm not going to play tcg i'm just going to play on my free to play master duel account I guess maybe is like an angle and a fear of like why they don't want to have like the same format. I think it's a weak argument, but like I assume it's probably it looks like something like that. Me's part that if they have Master Duel mimic TCG's format or even OCG's format for that matter, or both, and you can pick and choose, that people aren't going to buy the physical cards because why would you buy the physical cards when you could just play digitally? And arguably, it would be at a different cost. But I would argue that someone who's not going to directly buy product from Konami or a store anyway, they actually get to capitalize on the fact that they would be buying those cards in Master Duel to be able to play on Master Duel. Yeah, so, exactly. I don't know. I feel like it's a bit of misguided logic to assume that people just wouldn't play both, especially when we know that Duel Links and Master Duel been so successful in getting so many people back into the physical TCG. Of course, all of these examples are merely a continuation of ongoing trends. Even if yeah, the World I mean, Championship I, I, succeeded I agree. I giving like them a platform to showcase themselves scenario, to we should just have, like, the format The physical speed duel format launched in 2019, form. Duel Links launched in 2016, and Master Duel launched in 2022. Video games that offered digital duels or new play styles existed in 2005 when I threw my hands into the classic World Championship GBA title, and it wasn't the franchise's first foray into gaming either. We've definitely deviated from the old days of Yu-Gi-Oh trying to be anything except what it is, that's for sure, and Master Duel, I think, is the closest realistically we're probably ever going to get to like the best first party simulator when it comes to the actual Yu-Gi-Oh trading card game specifically and obviously there is still plenty of room for improvement but I'm I'm failing to see Master Duel 2 coming out anytime Whoa. soon where they can just keep improving on what they already have even if these experiences Imagine. did bring new players to the game and offer an accessible entry route into playing Yu-Gi-Oh for many how does this explain why 2023 in particular was a more accessible year for those wanting to give Yu-Gi-Oh a chance beyond the return of an uninterrupted competitive circuit and the community of card shops for in-person competition that is this comes from the commendable actions taken by Konami this comes from the commendable actions taken by Konami. I'm sorry, I need to read this again. This comes from the commendable actions taken by Konami to accelerate moves to democratize and lower the financial cost of entry to competitive TCG Yu-Gi-Oh for those looking to take the plunge. I'm reading this correctly, yes? Commendable actions taken by Konami to democratize and lower the financial cost of entry like, maybe you could argue the cost of entry to Yu-Gi-Oh! is, like, gotten a little bit better, um, pre-Phantom Nightmare anyway, but I don't know what this person is trying to say with democratize. Like, what do you mean, democratize? Like, this is not how this game is run. To competitive TCG Yu-Gi-Oh! for those looking to take the plunge. I'm sorry, I just had to repeat that again. Anyway, in other years, it would be understandable for a person to express interest in playing, only to balk at the... <laughs> It would be understandable for a person to express interest in playing only to bulk at the high cost of initial investment in building a deck that can compete with the best in the game. This issue has been addressed in a few ways. All right, let him cook, though. Let okay, him cook. I'm in. <laughs> Reprints are one obvious avenue, improving the financial state of the game for new players. I agree. The 25th anniversary rarity collection that, has set a wrong. new standard for how to make the core cards of the game more accessible not through multi-rarity print runs and card selection. Structure deck releases true, have not wrong. included not only common reprints of staple cards used across all decks due to their versatility, but have stood out in comparison to prior years for their strength. The recent... <laughs> the recent reloaded Fire King structures... <laughs> Like, 
Pre Phantom Nightmare? Like, this isn't completely wrong, though, to be fair, right? Like, didn't, like, literally pure Fire King top YCS Bologna? Like, that's, like, unironically, like, like that's partly true, right? Like, I'm sorry, if you can take, like, a, like, a, like, pure Fire King and top a YCS, you can say that, like, that isn't somewhat true. Um, it wasn't three structure. I didn't say that. Uh, but, you know, it was the budget version. So, you know. Double Diabelgia uh, engine was out. No, yeah. So there was like three or four Fire King tops with Snake Eye that obviously was pretty popular. Uh, but there was like, there was a top that was just Fire King. I don't know how budget it was though, to be fair. It probably still played IP, uh, SP. I could not have <laughs> picked a worse example. <laughs> the recent. I'm coping. How am I coping? This is like. I'm just, I'm not making this up. Fire King top YCS Bologna. Taking a, taking a little detour here. All new Fire King top 64. Sinful Fire King top 32. Uh, Fire King Sinful Spoil, Sinful Spoil Fire. So I think it's this one, right? Top 64. Pure oh Fire King, right? This one doesn't have the wanted engine. Okay, there's like all the Fire Kings. Like these are all just structure deck cards. Right. Like, remember, this is pre-Phantom Nightmare. This is what the Wanted Engine. Okay. And then a bunch of spells and traps here. Dude. Like, oh. <laughs> uh. I'm sure this... <laughs> Reloaded Fire King Structure Deck is a particularly <laughs> impressive release, promising a deck that can compete... Dude, okay, listen. I was, I was on the desk casting for YCS Bologna, and I swear to God, I remember there was... I, I'm pretty sure someone topped with um someone topped with pure fire king. Like may like is am I just making this I feel like I don't know, maybe my glasses aren't cron uh, aren't on correctly, but like I don't know, maybe someone can do some research real quick. The voices, dude, I swear to god, I feel I'm pretty certain there was one pure fire king top. Eat in tournament events just by picking no, up. No, sorry, I got I got a segue off of this really quick here. Hang on, hang on. YCS, Bo YCS Bologna Pure Fire King. No, come on. I'm not just making this up, right? Top 32, Kevin Eden versus uh, this guy. So I'm fairly sure certain it's this dude. Uh, Kevin Nephthys or something, I think his name is. Um, I, Like, I'm fairly certain that that's the dude. Actually. But if you look at... Maybe, maybe if you, like, look at his feature match here, like, he wins... Like... Like, for example, what does it say, right? Jesus it says, right, so his opponent is doing all this Sash. stuff. He's got a Fire King Sanctuary up here. This is game two here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right, maybe it's just the voices, dude. Maybe maybe it's the voices. But, like, I swear to God, I, I feel like I'm not making this up. Like, <laughs> oh, yes, I remember that, dude. You are right. Okay, have you got a link or something? They're all on Snake Eye. Oh, was I just yapping? Sorry, okay. Um, all right. You know, it's it's fine if I'm wrong. It's just I swear I th I thought I remembered that there was like a pure Fire King version. Um, first place, Joshua. Who's this guy? <laughs> That's insane. Uh, are all of these deck lists like available? This is uh okay. So this guy, this one's wanted. This is wanted. Wanted. Uh. Yeah, no, they all play the wanted. It. Okay, all right, never mind. Never mind. I take it back. I'm sorry. I apologize. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I apologize. I'm wrong. It, it's, um, found the Fire King pure deck profile. Wait, really? <laughs> here, and today I thought I'd bring to you a very, very late... <laughs> Deck and people just hate this card. It is so much fun. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> okay, all right. I'm sorry. I apologize. I take it out. I'm misremembering. I'm just actually just yapping. Three copies of the deck and merging them together. Okay. Okay. We made it through this section. <laughs> I have a lot to say here. Okay. You know, 2014 was 30 years ago. So for those who are 
not in the loop and are watching this, uh, we are currently going through a very turbulent time in Yu-Gi-Oh's history where some of the strongest in-engine cards you need to play the game are adding up to approximately $1,000. And that is before you even add in the like in-archetype necessary cards to play whatever deck it is that you are actually playing. We're talking about the Sinful Spoils package. We're talking about SP Little Knight. We're talking about Bonfire. All of these cards that have been recently coming out or even yet to come out because we still have the Snake Eyes cards and Promethean uh, Fire Princess, which is going to be released in Phantom Nightmare, which at the time of recording this hasn't been released yet. But considering we're looking at a potential Clueless, Tier Zero format, aware, those cards aware. are most likely going to be rarely coming. upgraded from the OCG and be even more expensive over here in the TCG as a result of that, especially because of their high demand, that we're already looking at one grand plus for like what is basically going to be one of the only playable decks if you want to play from a competitive perspective. And I understand. Uh, let's say you go on like a luxury hotel, uh, luxury like spa resort or something in like the Swiss Alps, right? And you go for like some skiing and stuff for like a weekend. Like, do you think that's like probably more than like a thousand, right? That's like two days of content. But if you buy like a full like Fire King Snake Eye deck for like a thousand, that's like four months of content. So like, that's like, uh, think about it, you know, like you could, you could finance it. You could take out a bank loan, you know, and with the current way that the interest rates are, um, you know, 7% or something like that, that's a pretty good rate, kind of, sort of, surely, right? Like, Klarna exists, you know, you can get PayPal finance. I think the game is in a pretty good state, personally. Understand that depending on when you jump into competitive Yu-Gi-Oh, that it's volatile, and sometimes it might be a more diverse format where there's more options for what decks you can play and such. But even if you look back and, like, retrace the past couple years of competitive Yu-Gi-Oh, it's still been pretty damn expensive, regardless of what deck you've been playing. Because nah, whether it's, it's specific pot expensive. cards, depending on the type of deck that you're playing, like, think about consistency like, with cards like Pot of Prosperity, whether it's you know, like, specific organ sales on the black market, like, you could easily get pay for a deck. Printing, like, some of the specific uh, planet field spells, like Paral I know for uh, your true element strategies and such, or any of the other cards that were Why printed every at high rarity that hadn't yet been printed because due to really the weird. time lapse and how long it takes to sometimes reprint these cards, competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! still definitely has a steep price tag attached to it. Now, all that said, the 25th anniversary rarity collection and, to an extent, the Fire King structure deck have done a good job. Like, to be, like in all fairness, by the way, like, um, like around about this video and this format, uh, just before, like, you know, Age of Overlord, and even partly, like, during some of Age of Overlord, like, like, there's some, like, pretty cheap options, right? Like, Pearly's on the lower end. Um, I want to say, like, um, like, Pure Rescue Ace was kind of an option. It was obviously, like, way more bricky. Um, Unchained was reasonable as well. But there was still, like, a couple of pieces that were, like, really important uh, for uh, in the extra deck for, like, the prices. So I guess that's, like, the major issue. But yeah, like... Yu-Gi-Oh! is an expensive game and has, like, always been, like, an expensive game for the most part. And it's a shame, like, because they just don't seem to do anything about it, right? Like, the game, it keeps fluctuating. We'll have, like, somewhat cheap formats, and then we'll have, like, the opposite end of the spectrum, which is, like, hey, you need to spend four digits to play the meta right now, right? And, like, that's just kind of sad. Um, it, 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 They just refuse to fix that because I guess they don't see a problem. And the problem is that... Um, or there is no problem because people keep buying, people keep, uh, keep purchasing the products. So there is no problem, right? What's the issue? That's kind of like the way they probably look at it. So of reprinting a lot of these competitive staple type cards, making them a lot more affordable to the masses. We're talking about any of the hand traps that you might see that are commonly played, like Ash Blossom and such. I'm pretty sure like Infinite and Permanent, you know, you're called by the graves. All these cards that you might use across a myriad of different strategies that are pretty interchangeable that are outside of the main core of what it is that your specific decks might require, right? We're also, when it comes to the Fire King structure deck, and not even just the Fire King structure deck, some of the other structure decks in years past, eventually they will take a high rarity staple card such as Ash Blossom and throw it into a structure deck like this. Ash Blossom has been reprinted in structure decks before. It was reprinted all the way back in the Soul Burner structure deck, which is, I want to say, four or five years old now at the time of recording this video. So it's not like Ash Blossom has never been reprinted up until this point. But point being is that Konami could do a better job at reprinting the cards, maybe in a more timely manner to make them more accessible. But at the same time, it's counterintuitive to Konami's business model. I don't think the reprints is the solution, by the way. I think reprints are good for, um, uh, like, rarity changes and stuff like that. Like, rarity collection is super cool because you can get, like, all of these new cards and, like, different rarities that you couldn't previously. I think that's, like... I think reprints are, like, a band-aid fix. I don't think reprints actually fix the pro fundamental problem, which is, like, cards are just too expensive. Like, like why is Wanted, like, $40 on release? Like, why did it spike to, like, 80 And it's like, okay, cool. Best case scenario, what? They reprint Wanted and, like, rarity collection too? Sure, we end up with, like, super Wanteds that become dirt cheap. But, like, well... 
you, you had to wait like six months for that, right? Like that's the problem. That's the issue, right? We, like we don't want to play budget players don't want to play the game on on like a delay because that's basically what happens for people who play reprints right like sword soul was like i don't want to say it was cheap like at its peak like when it was the best deck and like what was it national 22 before the reprints like it, it was pretty, pretty expensive right and it's like okay cool then we get the megatons and it reprints all of the sword soul cards and now it's like really cheap but it's like well now the deck has passed its time do you know what i mean like like budget players don't want like budget doesn't mean you should be you 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 should be forced to play the game like lagging right like budget means that you should have like dirt fucking rarity like you should be forced to play with like platinum wanteds and gold rare fucking bell stars right like that's what budget to me means you know like it's uh that's punishment enough you know uh like it's just silly that like if you want to play like the meta now you have to spend a thousand it's 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 crazy it's crazy model because that's also how they make money because if the in chase high demand cards are going to be at the higher rarity end rarity, of the huh? spectrum okay. and they're in the sets where that's the only way to really obtain them then that's how they're going to get a bunch of people to buy them and then that's going to keep the demand high and it's just a giant convoluted mess i could go on and on i'm obviously trying to stick within the, scope was the last of the time article gold, but by the way. i think the timing this of this article is of particular interest considering that we're not Often at a time where it's expensive, you, this expensive, to be jumping Love into competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! But I think this is just very poor timing considering the circumstances of what is exactly happening right now in the Yu-Gi-Oh! community. And I think that's a bit unfortunate given uh, the circumstances. <laughs> I would even argue that this part right here, for a person to express interest in playing only to balk at the high cost of initial investment in building a deck that can compete with the best in the game, I would even argue that even if we're not on the perspective, you know, front end of seeing a tier zero format or a very like limited narrow format of only being like one or two decks that are playable i would even argue that even in a diverse format where there's several decks that are playable i think the majority of people will continue to balk at the high cost of initial investment because by the way you see diverse formats they're the ones that produce the cheapest formats the if they uh distribute the rarities correctly um if there's like five viable decks and they make all of the archetype centric cards the secret rares and stuff like that you get like very cheap formats um, but the problem is, like, you have a diverse format, and you have, like, key important pieces like SP Little Knight, which is played in all of those decks, and that's the secret rare, uh, which is, like, a huge problem, you know? So even even if they were to, like, not even, like, you know, do some, do, do this, like, crazy revamp of the, um, of the structure of products or something like that, like they do in the OCG, where every card is available in, like, most rarities or whatever, uh, they just have to distribute, like, the secret rares differently, you know? And that's, like... That's that's just how it works. Um, it's basic supply and demand. Yes, thank you. That's that's what I'm saying. Um, because there's less people playing those decks. Whereas when it's a tier zero deck, um, archetype specific secret rares are just going to be more important, uh, more expensive because everyone wants those cards. But if there's four or five viable decks, not everyone is going to play those decks. Therefore, the demand for those uh, for those secret rares goes down compared to like SP Little Knight, which is in every single car, uh, every single deck in the game. Because for a lot of individuals. Investing even a few hundred dollars into a competitive deck is extraordinarily expensive and something that people don't want to do, which is why they may not take the leap into competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! Other games, for instance, uh, don't have this issue nearly as much, but it's different because those games are structured differently, they're managed differently, the way their cards are released into the ecosystem is drastically different than what Yu-Gi-Oh! does. At the, at the bare minimum, I mean, set rotation exists, right? Like, that's enough to just sort of keep the price of some things in check. I mean, take a look at Pokemon. If you want to play competitive Pokemon, the decks aren't nearly as expensive as they are if you want to play Yu-Gi-Oh! And so, again, yeah, if you're a Pokemon. fan of card games and maybe you like both Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh! If you're really wanting to take up the mantle and start playing one of them competitively, then if you look at the entry point in terms of picking up a competitive Pokemon deck, let's say you're buying everything secondhand, versus a Yu-Gi-Oh! deck at any given moment, I think if you're going based solely on price, Yu-Gi-Oh! is going to lose out most of the time, unless you're loving... Is it like the best deck in Pokemon at any one time? Like maybe a maximum of like 240, maybe 300, right? Like maximum, and that's like, you know, the high end, you know, whereas in Yu-Gi-Oh! like the maximum is like... <laughs> Kind of rarely, like every like couple of months, every few years, you will see a deck that will like be like a thousand from scratch. Love for Yu-Gi-Oh! really overshadows your love for Pokemon, then that's just a scenario where Yu-Gi-Oh! is never really going to win. I also feel like the 25th anniversary collection is also a major black swan event when it comes to the Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG as a whole, because they it can't a lot more sustainably manageable for a child, huh? continuously print was rarity collections I love every Lugio. single year, because eventually they're going to print so many copies of these cards, especially if it's the ones that are the highest in demand, that they're going to drive the prices of those cards into the ground. And you might think that that's a good thing, but I would argue it's not, because then that means the product itself doesn't hold value. If the product doesn't hold value, if they release it to the distributors and the card stores to then sell it to the players, the card stores and anyone who's selling the initial 
initial sealed product isn't going to make any money on it. And then as a result of that, they're going to take a huge loss. They're not going to want to reorder it because then the confidence in the product goes down to zero, which means then they're not going to order from the distributors. And then essentially it's going to erode all confidence in the market. And so it's a very fine dance that has to be played when it comes to like reprinting cards. And I mean, with the 25th anniversary collection, TLDR, very long-winded way of saying that the reprints is basically not the correct method, right? Like, like that was a very, like, detailed uh, breakdown, correctly so, explaining that basically reprints is not the solution, right? Like, that, that's not the issue. It's like you need to make the product good inherently. You can't just, like, reprint, like, the product months later on a lag expecting it to do well unless those cards are actually relevant, right? Like, that's, that's, that's the issue. And, like, the, the fundamental, like, structure of the boxes, like, need to be changed, probably we gave a lot of these cards what like seven cards. different sure. printings and if you look over here ash blossom with all of its different printings now courtesy of the rarity collection it's still like three dollars a copy which is insane all things considered there's also the argument of when it comes to nine dollars for a play set of a card maybe i don't know it's weird because in pokemon a budget that could just be like 10 bucks like total total so i don't know maybe, maybe that is actually weird if you think about it in the grand scheme of things to reprinting some of these cards, how useful they are to being reprinted for the people who are considering entering the competitive landscape, right? Because while, yes, they just reprinted stuff like Jesus Ash Blossom and all of these common bro. staple cards that Pedro. have been part of Yu-Gi-Oh! I mean, Ash Blossom is how old now? Like, 2016? So I feel like, like this video is sort card. of just kind of, when like, it comes to these turning cards, into, like, They've been around for right? quite some time, you know, and they've like been the a part of competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! Yu for years. But they may dip in and out of formats depending on whether or not the cards are actually useful or not. That's The, the issue isn't with necessarily reprinting some of these other cards because even prior to the rarity collection going back to this how many other printings of ash blossom had existed maximum crisis was the original printing it had dual devastator maximum gold legendary collection kaiba shadows and valhalla dual power mega tins the structure decks multiple one structure deck two structure deck three structure deck and then all of the versions of the 25th anniversary printing on top of all of that and so there isn't an issue i feel like with these cards in particular the issue is with the way that the financial model of card games exists in general right because in order to keep people buying your product there needs to be a degree of power creep to get people interested in buying the new cards, but also with the way Yu-Gi-Oh! works specifically, because it's an eternal format, Yu-Gi-Oh! needs to ban certain cards, so that way the decks that are considered the best decks at any given moment after enough time has passed, then get knocked down a peg and are either not nearly as playable as they were before, or become completely unplayable because some of their best cards either get limited or banned to the point where the deck isn't consistent enough to play. So then new cards have to come in and fill that power vacuum, and specifically new cards, not just older cards, because if the new cards come and fill the power vacuum, that means people are going to go out and buy those new cards. And so it just creates this cyclical and by the way like i hope you absorbed all of everything he just said um but just to uh just to reiterate on that point there a, a, a thing a, a piece that he didn't mention was like um Yu -Gi -Oh has rotation just uh it isn't called rotation it's called the ban list right um and so when you ban the best decks uh you need to replace it with product that people want to buy so, so the company makes money right so you bring in new power crept um archetypes etc etc now the issue also on top of that also is that what happens when you ban the current best decks well then the previous best decks become the best decks right logically so not only does the does the new product have to be better than the previous be uh, have to be um the best decks they have to be better than the previous best decks um and so those previous best decks just fade into irrelevance because they have to be banned and hit on the lists for way longer than they need to be, for example, Orcust, um, in order to drive sales of the new product. And that's a frustrating experience for people who like pet decks and who like a lot of those older decks, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and yeah, of course, there you go. Like, Tier Limit is a good example, right? Because, like, that's a deck with a lot of staying power, right? Because that deck can probably never be power crept, although, you know, never be careful what you wish for. Um, they have to, like, severely, drastically hit a deck like Tier Limit. Um, even though that's like a hugely popular fan favorite deck, they have to bring in new decks to be better than it, to, uh, to drive uh, product and sales. Therefore, tier limit should never be allowed to be like playable or good um, in or if, if they want to make money. And that's frustrating for everyone because tier limit is like one example, but there's plenty of times where those, you know, second and third, fourth best decks are fan favorites. People love them. They want to play them, uh, but there's no financial incentive to make them good. So they have to hit them way more past their point. I think Orcust is the best example for this, right? You know? The, be the best example for this. And that's like, you know, something that really upsets a lot of people. Dynamic that...
understandably even if so. we get these massive reprint sets like the 25th anniversary collection, there's still going to be this disparity. Like, we just had the 25th anniversary collection, and everyone right now in the Yu-Gi-Oh! community is complaining that Yu-Gi-Oh! is too expensive. You would argue that the opposite would be true, and people are cheering in the streets that the game is as accessible as it ever has been, but in fact, the opposite is true. <laughs> that's not to say reprints are- Is that weird? We had Rarity Collection, which you'd think, like, that's it. The game is fixed. We had Rarity Collection. It was, like, the, one of the best sets, probably probably the best set ever in the history of Yu-Gi-Oh! Unironically. Um, people love Rarity Collection. That shit sold out instantly. Boxes of those things, like, retail for, like, double what they were initially or something, right? Um, and uh, you'd think, like, that should fix the game, but it didn't. It, just, it didn't. <laughs> because there's still a lot of things that are missing from it. Because Yu-Gi-Oh! is such an expansive ca card game. Uh, so Rarity Collection 2? I don't know, what do they need to do? Reprint freaking all of the fire decks? Are we gonna get bonfire reprints? Again, like, reprints are not the solution anyway. Like, they just have to fix, like, the fundamental, uh, card structure of, like, the products. Or bad or anything. Like, obviously, if more people have access anyway, to Anyway, I don't want to keep talking fine, about the, uh, expensive thing here. So let's, uh, a massive, this is arguably let's let the Mr. most Chimo here keep going until we, uh, massive move on from that subject. Because we, we all know the arguments. History. We've all talked about it for Even a while. with that, the game is still prohibitive from a cost perspective for the large majority of people who want to jump in on the competitive level. It's insane to think that Konami has released what is arguably the greatest reprint set of all time, and immediately after that, we are at a point where Yu-Gi-Oh! is one of the most cost-prohibitive competitive formats we have seen Such an in irony, quite some time. Like, the, the divide is staggering. The Sacred Fire Kings in the deck center their effects around destruction. Driven by the primary boss monster featured on the packaging, Sacred Fire King Runix, a card which can special summon itself from the hand and further its combos by destroying monsters from the deck if successful. It makes things easier than ever for newer players, only helped by plans to release a new two-deck starter set in January that allows you to team up with a friend and learn the ropes from two pre-built decks in a single set. This is sort of what I was alluding to earlier in the video when I talked about that the definition of Yu-Gi-Oh being accessible is entirely subjective because accessibility how, right? If it's accessibility in terms of being able to play Yu-Gi-Oh, I don't think Yu-Gi-Oh really has an issue with that necessarily. There are plenty of outlets for people to get their Yu-Gi-Oh fix, whether it's through like the true nature of like actual Yu-Gi-Oh or an alternative way to play Yu-Gi-Oh, whether it's a retro Time Wizard format, whether it's Speed Duel, Duel Links, all that. There's no accessibility issue in terms of actual I think, again, like, I mentioned this earlier, uh, but the fact that he, like, is subconsciously using terminology like the true Yu-Gi-Oh! when discussing current modern advanced format, I think is, is the biggest problem with Yu-Gi-Oh! Too many people and too much of the game is perceived to be playable through only one lens, and I think that needs to change, um, and I think that needs to, like, um, that, that, that needs to change, uh, because we, we have to have alternative formats that are just as good and just as... Uh, meaningful as the uh current standard advanced format there needs to be like more pushing for like an equality to like you know time was we need like unironically uh, like an edison ycs we need like draft to become a thing um a very serious competitive format etc etc like i that is my goal and that is my wish for the game uh because i think like modern yugio is marmite people don't like modern yugio and some people love modern yugio um and there needs to be options because 20 years of design, like Yu-Gi-Oh is cannibalizing itself. That's the biggest problem is Yu-Gi-Oh cannibalizes itself. Yu-Gi-Oh has so much um, great history. These snapshots of all of these amazing, great different formats we've had historically in Yu-Gi-Oh can all be played at any one time, but there's no incentive to, and there's no reason to, and there's not even discoverability to. Like uh, who wants to play 2016 Inov format? You say that like half the like most people look at you like you're crazy like what does what does that mean i don't even know what set that is you know like what year is that right but like as, as a snapshot for the game like that is that was one of the most incredible formats we've ever had in Yu-Gi-Oh. why don't we have ways to like uh take these popular uh or take these good snapshots of the game and make them um uh, you know a part of like uh the modern sort of uh or rather the default approach to playing the game um Again, like, I think the, the issue is, like, we need things like Draft, we need things like uh, Time Wizard to be pushed more, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and I think, like, the issue is, like, um, it's the, it's every, everyone, everyone just sees Modern Current Advanced Constructed as, like, the only way to play the game, which needs to change. Actually playing Yu-Gi-Oh! itself, where the accessibility problems arise are from what seems to be a price perspective and when we're talking about this two-player starter set that's going to be released here soon i think entry into the game itself is also a prohibitive issue that Yu-Gi-Oh! continues to deal with. Yu-Gi-Oh!, in my opinion, is probably the Comes most complex card game to play it, not out of all of them, it. Exactly. just because it has the That's steepest learning curve, they need because to it. it's throwing so much at you at once if you are starting from ground zero, and a lot of people who start learning Yu-Gi-Oh!, 
typically start learning Yu-Gi-Oh by playing older formats just to get a grasp of the fundamentals. You can teach people how to play old Yu-Gi-Oh formats like GOAT format, Edison and such, because there isn't a ton of complexity going on there. And it really hones in on the fundamentals of, you know, normal summoning, a few special summons, setting cards, activating spells and traps, a lot of heavy emphasis on battle as well in the older formats, because again, that's how you actually win the game. But Newer Yu-Gi-Oh! is a far cry from any of those older formats in the way that it's played because there's so much going on, the cards have so much text, and there's so much complexity because so many cards have multiple effects, and sometimes so many things are adding up at a singular point that it can be overwhelming for a lot of players to really hop in and really get excited about a game like this. But that also plays to Yu-Gi-Oh!'s strength as well because there's no other card game that really plays like Yu-Gi-Oh! does in its modern state. And so... I know they're releasing this starter set here in January at the time of recording this, but seeing some of the previews for the but just a uh, modern Yu-Gi-Oh is like uh, is too complicated. By the way, like I'm sorry, but if at the very highest level of the game, on you watch a YCS live stream and it's like top eight, some of the best players in the world, and there's multiple judge calls for like Ill illegal activations, like we can like make the the same old rehashed haha uh, Keck W joke of uh you know, um, uh reading Keck W, uh but like. It, it comes to a point where it's like, no, this is like a problem. This is a problem. If, if the best players like keep making mistakes and there's constant, constant illegal activations at the highest level, so, like something's wrong. Like something is wrong, you know? Cards in the set. I don't exactly know, know how well this vlogs, is going yep. to act as an entry Time point stamp, to really illegal. get people into Yu-Gi-Oh! Because it's a really tall ask. Even Master Duel with some of the single player solo missions that you can play, even that is a difficult argument to get people into playing Yu-Gi-Oh! Because when you're playing throughout the tutorials or those solo missions, that's not like playing Yu-Gi-Oh! against a regular opponent. And there's so many different cards because there's over 10,000 cards in the game that you're having to just learn so much at a single point. For people like me or anyone who grew up, you know, essentially when the game was first released or even grew up with the show for that matter, it was easier for us to transition into more complex versions of Yu-Gi-Oh! Because we grew up with the bare basic fundamentals of how to play and so then when you throw in synchro summoning when there's no other summoning mechanic then it's like oh okay you add the numbers you make sure you have a tuner that's not too difficult and then once we get to exceed summoning which you have to remember there's several years in between when synchro summoning and exceed summoning were released then it's like oh i take two monsters with the same level and put them on top of each other that doesn't seem too difficult but again you're, you're having several years to condition yourself and get used to this versus someone who's entering Yu Gi Oh in 2024 it's maddening it's overwhelming and it's unreal it's just compounding complexity, right? Like when you've played something, when you've played Yu-Gi-Oh for twenty years, it's very easy. Like Yu-Gi-Oh is very simple, like at a fundamental level, right? Like all of the, every single part of Yu-Gi-Oh is pretty simple, right? Main phase simple, battle phase eh, fairly simple. Um, how to synchro summon, how to exceed summon, how to link summon, fairly simple. Now, if you combine all of that together, all at once for a new player who has no grasp and no background on it, it's really confusing. It's 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 overwhelming. It's a lot. Um, so each individual part is simple, but all of it together is, uh, yeah, that's, it's, it's, it's hard. And I don't know what the, I don't know, I don't know how you fix that. I don't know. Like you would literally have to make like a new format, like literally just make like speed duel two, but it's like modern Yu-Gi-Oh! Like restart the game. That'd be crazy. What if we had like an alternative format and it was like rotation Yu-Gi-Oh! But it was just like rebooted. Like what if we just reboot Yu-Gi-Oh! Just re-release like the first set. Maybe, I don't, I don't know. Maybe that could work realistic to expect that people are going to get excited about something like this when they watch someone do like a 40 card turn one combo and they're gonna have no fucking clue what's going on also i just have to say can we stop printing vanilla monsters in starter products we can print a starter product that has i i disagree by the way i disagree like i i saw i saw like one of the biggest criticisms of the starter set was like why is there vanillas in here it's like no that absolutely you need the vanillas like the fact that your opening hand is five vanillas that's very good Okay, because you need to look at it from the perspective of someone who has no idea um, of how to play Yu-Gi-Oh! at all, like zero background. So it's like, now you need to learn like a draw phase, a standby, a main phase, how to summon, how many summons, the positions of the summon, what happens when you attack, what happens when you set. Like, you throw in effects on top of everything I just said, it's way too complicated. Vanillas are fine, you know? simple effect monsters because i think the two player set literally does that you start with vanilla monsters and then you start using card effects you know actual Yu-Gi-Oh does not play vanilla monsters unless there's a very specific reason to play a non-effect vanilla monster we, wow, we need to players completely abandon Alex. that old thinking like if you're going to teach people about normal monsters like make them play evil swarm or something because at least there's a reason to play an, a normal monster in an evil swarm deck i'm sorry
Coupled with the balance of the current play late game, making me. more decks than ever a viable strategy for competitive glory. Oh, this was not written recently. It gives players to the remit to play just about anything provided they have the strategy and skill to upset and overcome an opponent. It's a far healthier state of the game than ever. I gotta do this again. It's a far healthier state of the game than ever than seen towards the end of 22 and the start of 2023 when the domination of Kashtir and Element left little space for other decks to compete. Yeah, we're, we're about to, we're on the precipice of that happening once again, unfortunately, but it is what it is. With more competition comes a more level and exciting competitive game for newcomers and veterans alike, which can only be a good thing. I don't agree with that necessarily don't get me wrong there are formats where you can play budget decks in terms of that they're like maybe tier two or roguish strategies that actually have a fighting chance against the best decks of any particular format but you have there are very few instances where you can pick up a tier one and i'm talking about one of the best decks of the format for an affordable price because that's just how the law of supply and demand works unless the cards were introduced into the ecosystem in such a I way don't wanna, i don't want to go back into this because i think we've talked about it enough but up. sure and so We've seen that in the past with some other strategies, but even so, like if they're structure deck based archetypes, like maybe for instance, Salomon Great and Dinosaur, even those decks required specific other pieces in order to be played at the top levels of competitive play. But I will say it's not as- I think the most important thing of the structure deck, by the way, was like, correct me if I'm wrong, but Sunlight Wolf was like unavailable. You had to buy that and that was like a 15 pound rare or something, correct? as bad compared to when the majority of the cards for a certain archetype or deck are released in core sets because then a lot of the time they're going to be at the higher end of the rarity spectrum, which means the price for those cards That's is going to funny. go through the roof. Why I would also argue that healthier state this? of the game is subjective here as well because some people would argue that a more diverse metagame is healthier because more decks can be played and to an extent that could be true, but again, I feel like it's subjective. I think more competitive players would argue that more narrow formats where only a few decks are good because then there's less other decks on the peripheral that need to be concerned about. And then if you're talking about strategy and skill, if it really comes down to who's the more skillful player, if there's less blowouts or less variance in terms of what you might encounter at a competitive level, then the more skillful player on paper should win more often than not. Which leaves us entering 2024 and the game's anniversary in the healthiest state Yu-Gi-Oh has enjoyed throughout its post-COVID existence. From a time when the game struggled, we can look back on the game's success post -COVID, and see it pass maybe. for another 25 years. Nostalgic fans can enjoy the past via collectible releases and the Just legendary collection, and from right? that, feel capable of diving into the modern game in a way that was once too intimidating or expensive for many to fully enjoy. Ultimately, a game can't sustain itself. That's not like a very high bar. Forever. A key stumbling block for Yu-Gi-Oh! has been its lack of an entry point for new players. An anniversary year will naturally garner attention for the franchise, and the upcoming Tokyo Dome Showcase and celebratory releases are just the start of what promises to be a big year worthy of that increased scrutiny. This means nothing if the game can't capitalize on that to find new strength. Yeah, for the exactly. first time in a long time, you need thanks to, to its digital physical reforms, right, it feels like Yu-Gi-Oh! is putting keep, its best foot forward at the most good stuff like that and making the game I think now that we've wrapped this article up, I want to just reiterate that I don't think from an accessibility standpoint, Yu-Gi-Oh! suffers from actually getting people to play the game. Whether it's the way you like to play Yu-Gi-Oh!, I like to play Yu-Gi-Oh!, or your friends like to play Yu-Gi-Oh!, there's not an issue getting people to actually play Yu-Gi-Oh! in whatever form it is that they prefer to play. I think the larger issue stems from two issues. The two issues are actually onboarding newer players to get into the game because of the steep complexity curve, because of the fact that it's a 25-year-old game, and how do you balance keeping your hardcore audience of devoted fans happy and interested in the game while also simultaneously appealing to new players, whether you're trying to poach them from other card games or maybe appeal to an entirely different huh, audience altogether poaching. while not relinquishing or sacrificing what it is that makes Yu-Gi-Oh what it is. But then also you have the fact that it's very price prohibitive for a lot of people. And I think that's something that Konami honestly has direct control over at the end of the day, because yes, obviously we have economics at play here when it comes to supply and demand and all that. But at the same time, we can look to the OCG, which has a completely different rarity model and the distribution of the way that their cards are released. Most cards are affordable to the average player. And it's rare to see a card exceed somewhere in the neighborhood of like 35 to $40. That's considered expensive in the OCG. And yeah, which Konami's is aware like of this. Much, Konami knows way. that over in the OCG, think a, a that's their audience and that's 20, what they're willing like to spend on cards. Card, Whereas in the TCG, opinion, they know know that people are willing to spend Ever. way more and so that's why we have artificial short printing that's why we have all these different elements at play here that result in our market dynamics being a lot different than when it comes to asia and it's unfortunate because it feels like a lot of these things could be fixed it feels like a lot of these things could be remedied in pretty sustainable ways moving forward but i think at the end of the day the profit motive is really just what's driving the decisions that they make and they are a business at the end of the day so it is what it is it sucks too right because i know that you and i love Yu Gi Oh. that's probably why you're watching this video in all honesty well the uh two you main fundamental uh takeaways feel ways i guess is like you know you go uh too expensive have them absolutely and uh you go too complicated when you 
Um, and probably a third one as well is like uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! Too Narrow. There's only like very few ways to play the game, um, which doesn't help into lending itself to being new player friendly, which ties into the second point. And of course, if you can't even afford the cards in the first place, then neither of those two points apply at all. So, interesting discussion. I suppose we're almost done here. That's where the core audience is at the end of the day. We were hooked from the beginning and we're still hooked now. That's why we're here. Overall, I think the article was fine. It made it made some valid points. There were some things that were completely misguided, but I also don't know how much of that was just due to the timing of when this article was specifically released and the way that the market conditions specifically because of like what's happening in the competitive setting have uh, sort of converged at this exact moment when we're recording this video. But in any case, I mean, I just want Yu-Gi-Oh! to last as long as possible because this game's great. It's a lot of fun. And uh, if there's any way that we can just continue to bring people into the game any easier, make it more accessible for people, I think that's something that we can all agree on. So thank you guys so much for watching. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments and uh, we'll see you next time. All right, sick. Um, yeah, I don't. Uh, I think I've uh, given all of my thoughts and points on it. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's a poyo from me.